I am here with Brian Bennett. He is a former South Carolina law enforcement instructor. He is now retired um, and he is um, a trainer and consultant in areas of um, domestic violence, strangulation, elder, vulnerable adults and elder abuse. I mean, you do kind of the gambit of everything. Um, and, you know, I had been, I've been working on a lot of stories, um, very difficult stories lately, uh, relating to individuals who had died. Um, and there was prior history of domestic violence, strangulation specifically, and we connected online and, uh, you know, it is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, I wanted to have a conversation um, just, you know, about your experience, what you think can be done, um, and, you know, how we can start doing better um, in South Carolina protecting people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this, uh, you know, it's sad that unfortunately it's only in October during Domestic Violence Awareness Month that that we seem to um, have a, an emphasis on these type of issues. But the reality of it is that these issues of domestic violence and strangulation particularly happen every day, 365 days a year, all hours of the days and night to many different people. And there needs to be an emphasis on this every day of the year because of how pervasive it is and how historically uh, these types of assaults are repeated. And then ultimately what they end up uh, becoming, which is homicides. And obviously that's not where we want to be. South Carolina is always in the top 10. The most recent number I saw was that we're number six. We've always been in the top 10 for almost over 20 years. I think this strangulation issue if we bring specific laser focus to it, South Carolina could dramatically reduce our number of domestic homicides. Um, I'm not really one to um, focus on uh, rates per se. We know that in spite of every effort, 100% effort that every entity, every profession can give, we know that we're still gonna have domestic homicides, unfortunately. It's the nature of, of it's human nature for some people to be evil. But let's do everything that we can do to reduce the numbers. And strangulation uh, or indications of strangulation in a historical context are the number one indicator that a, fu a future homicide is going to occur. So when we pick up on these issues early on, we have a strong uh, backing or a strong support to, to limit the number of homicides in South Carolina, domestic related specifically. And it's not just an indicator for, you know, homicides. It, it's an indicator for a lot of uh, crimes like mass murders. And you, it's it's an indicator for a lot of things. So I think the legislation could do a lot in terms of preventing crime in general. No, you're right. Um, you know, when we looked at uh, numbers in South Carolina, um, 44 44 percent of other crimes are related to domestic violence. That was something that we found in the governor's domestic violence task force report from back in 2015, which I was uh, co-chairman of one of those divisions. That's just looking at domestic violence, things like um, property damage, stalking, harassment, um, intimidation, 44 percent of other crimes just with domestic violence. But when you look particularly at strangulation nationally, what research has pointed to is that there, are, like you said, are a number of uh, mass shooters who, when their history was checked, had patterns of strangling their intimate partners before committing mass shootings. And so when we say the uh, number one indicator of a homicide, well, the first thought that people come to is the, the targeted domestic violence victim survivor. But in reality, those homicides extend beyond what we call the household member definition or the intimate partner definition. Those homicides are also indicated of our law enforcement officers. Uh, there, the number of law enforcement officers who are ambushed and feloniously killed in the United States, there's a correlation between individuals who have a history of strangling and killing law enforcement officers or having to be shot by law enforcement officers. And then so we have law enforcement officers. We have the public at large due to mass uh, homicides, mass shootings. We have targeted domestic violence victims. But then we all also have this collateral damage, people that don't meet the definition like children, other ch 
children in the relationship, uh, other family members that try to intervene, they aren't counted in some of the homicide statistics for domestic violence. Sometimes it's only the targeted domestic violence victim and not the two or three children or the mother or the father or the brother or sister that tried to intervene at that time. So, again, the emphasis on the strangulation really is a safety issue for all South Carolinians and, and everyone nationally as well. And we are, as a state, we are lacking in legislation. We are the only state in the United States that does not have legislation specific to strangulation, right? That's correct. So let's talk about specifically about domestic violence. In uh, 2015, South Carolina had the um, domestic violence reform that took place within the House of Representatives. Out of that 2015 domestic violence reform committee, uh, strangulation language uh, to some extent was added, but only specifically to domestic violence. The problem with that is strangulation was not specifically defined and they allowed for graduated charges. So technically under domestic violence law in South Carolina, you can strangle somebody and be charged with a misdemeanor tried in summary court. Well, that is that is not reflective of the true danger and the threat to someone's life that non-fatal strang- strangulation actually is. And it also only focused on domestic violence. It did not consider strangulation, non-fatal strangulation against our vulnerable adults, our children, because children get strangled as well, uh, sexual assault victims, uh, kidnapping victims, and even human trafficking. You know, human trafficking is, is one of those hot button topics as well. And human trafficking victims uh, are routinely strangled as well, because especially within the sex trade, the human trafficking victim is the physical commodity. And these, these um, trafficking, these traffickers, they don't want these individuals out covered in bruises. And as I'm sure we'll talk about later with some of the subtle signs and indicators, someone can be strangled almost to death and have no external injuries on their body. So South Carolina, as you said, is the last state left to specifically define a strangulation, uh, strangulation and have a strangulation law most states, not all, most states automatically qualify strangulation as a felony. And I can explain later when we get into the legal aspect why that needs to be the case. And, and that puts South Carolina in a very bad position uh, in, in most regards, because that means we haven't recognized the danger. You know, if we, if we know how dangerous something is, why would we not do everything we could to prevent it? For example, everybody knows how dangerous fentanyl is. Well, South Carolina relatively quickly passed a fentanyl trafficking law because everyone knows how dangerous fentanyl is. Well, most people don't know how dangerous strangulation is, and I think misinformation and lack of education has led us uh, to being one of the last. Now, but here's here's the silver lining to it. If we are the last state, we have 49 other states to model from And we can take the best aspects of those existing statutes and try to come up with the strongest legislation in the country to address this issue. So that's the silver lining to this, if there is one. Yeah. Yeah. And so so, if we do manage to get strangulation law legislation passed, um, Mm -hmm. what would the benefits be? You know, they somebody who is accused of, you know, strangling another person, regardless of you know, if it's somebody they live with, if it's somebody they're dating, if it's somebody, their mother, if it's an, you know, child, um, that would, they would be charged with strangulation and not just assault and battery, right? Correct. Correct. So, so let's, uh, so one of the benefits is tracking. I I know victim safety and triage at the hospital is important and and I'm going to get to that, but let me address this issue first. In the governor, Governor Haley, then at that time, Governor Haley, by executive order, um, she formed the Domestic Violence Task Force. And what we found in our first phase research is that South Carolina has a very poor network to gather data. Our systems don't connect with each other. We speak different languages in, in our terminology and our vernacular. And so it's almost impossible to track strangulation specifically because it gets mixed in under other statutes and other charges with different language like choking and 
and just, you know, a series of words like hands on a neck. Well, you can't search for those things with the databases that we have. Right. So tracking and giving actual numbers for South Carolina has been incredibly difficult. Well, here's one of the benefits to having a specific strangulation statute. When you define it and you have a specific statutory code, now it's easy to track. And if you're going to introduce legislation, you want to see that the legislation is effective or where it's not effective to improve it later. Well, if we don't have something specific, it's going to get, as it is now, sometimes pushed under our different assault laws or our maybe our, our vulnerable adult statute or a child protection statute, and it gets lost in the mix. And therefore, you're still left with no ability to track rates and improvements or deficiencies. So that's what I see as one of the main benefits is specific tracking across different um, uh, perf- um, different job duties. For, for example, law enforcement, the solicitor's office, the judiciary, victim services, and you know hospital administration records and that sort of thing. So when you define it, when you have a specific code, it makes it so much easier for us to collect numbers and evaluate our work. The second thing it does is it would necessitate that everyone get trained on the signs, symptoms, and indicators of strangulation. Now, when when I was an instructor at the State Police Academy, one thing that I decided to do was integrate non-fatal strangulation awareness into the basic training program for law enforcement officers. Um, the hope was is that they would have that base knowledge and that the agencies would continue on with higher levels of advanced training, which I offered and I still offer. But what we also found and what is startling is that outside of law enforcement, there's no profession in South Carolina that has a standardized strangulation training curriculum. So you would expect that your nurses and your doctors might have some unique understanding of this, and the fact is they don't. Our forensic nurses do, or what we call our sexual assault nurse examiners or forensic nurses do, because they have a specific curriculum. But when you look at the curriculum for our medical field as a whole, paramedics, EMTs, again, nurses, doctors, they don't understand the signs, symptoms, and indicators. They haven't been taught the dangers, and they haven't been taught the imaging recommendations to triage those victims and to collect evidence. And then when you get to our prosecutors and our judiciary, they don't have that either. And so all the people that have a power to intervene, most of them don't have any awareness themselves. So how can they bring awareness to someone else? And so I think the statute would necessitate, it, it can't mandate, but it can necessitate these different profession professional designations to develop training curriculum so that they can be in compliance with the law for not just criminal justice purposes, but for victim and patient care. Right. Right. Yeah. I talked to a victim of um, domestic violence yesterday and she had been in the hospital after assaults three times, um, including strangulation. And the third time was the first time a nurse picked up on what had happened and got her out of the situation. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, you know, it, that wasn't even South Carolina. That was a main in a state that does have mm-hmm. legislation, but you know, it does, it did drive home the importance of training across the board and, you know, how, how this can prevent tragedies. Mm-hmm. And I, and I think that's a perfect example of, even though this particular individual went to the hospital, were they given the necessary and proper advisements and, you know, ultimately the third time, perhaps, yes, but the two previous times could have could have actually um, caused her death. Right. And, you know, uh, nationally, statistically, if you take 100 substantiated cases of strangulation, only about three of those cases ever get to the hospital. And even out of those three out of 100, those three don't often get the triage care and advisements that they need. And so, um Sometimes even under the best of circumstances, we can be deficient, but, you know, we have to do something. We have to start somewhere to improve the response. We have to make those, I think, I think the those statute, circumstances. We have to make them the best. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and it's really the what I call the frontline people that have the greatest amount of influence and the greatest ability to recognize what's going on than the third or fourth person down the chain. 
Right. You know, we can't, we can't expect a, a, a victim. And I, and I say victim, not, it's not to minimize or diminish individuals. Right. Statutorily under the law, they're called victims, but, but personally we call them survivors. So that's right. why I say victim survivors. We can't expect victim survivors to tell us what we need to know. We need to know what we need to know so that we can ask the right questions to gain clarity and then offer the proper resolutions from that. Right. You know, are there any downsides? So when, when strangulation legislation is being proposed, are there like, are there pushbacks? Are there downsides to this legislation that Mm -hmm. you anticipate? Well, um, let's give everybody historical context of what South Carolina has done up to now. Um, Approximately seven to eight years ago, myself and a few other individuals, we drafted the first bill, non-fatal strangulation bill for South Carolina, and that was um, sponsored by Senator Katrina Sheely out of Lexington. That first, I guess, first attempt uh, in the two-year legislative session didn't get any discussion whatsoever because, I, because as some people may or may not be aware, when bills are filed, they're discussed and they're put on like a rank of what's most important and discussions in our General Assembly get things pushed to the top or pushed to the bottom. Well, it, it, it didn't even make it on the list, quite frankly. The second time we introduced a bill, which was also sponsored by Katrina Sheely, uh, we made some modifications to the language, and we did get a discussion within the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee, but that discussion literally only lasted about five minutes. It did not give us the proper time to really vet out and discuss it, but to their credit, they did move it into the full um, the full Judiciary Committee, which is a, is a closed meeting. But in that three-hour meeting, only about seven minutes was devoted to the strangulation bill. And quite frankly, members of our legislature who happen to be defense attorneys are the ones that were most resistant to it as it was unnecessary and unneeded. And I'll let people draw their own conclusions as to why they argue that. But uh, effectively, the um, that bill was was um, a tabled. And then the most recent bill, which was in the last couple of years, which was House Bill 3684, Uh, Thankfully, that was um, sponsored by Senator, uh, excuse me, House Rep. Rob Harris, who happens to have a nursing background. He understood it. It didn't get any traction either. It wasn't even discussed. I mean, it was put on the pre-filed bills, but it didn't go anywhere. So there have been measures and attempts to bring this before our General Assembly. And probably within the last year, uh, the greatest amount of information has been given to members of our Senate to actually explain the problem in South Carolina, what the dangers are associated with it, and uh, what the benefits are. But what I see personally is um, the biggest pushback is that it is unnecessary, that, that, that it's not needed. We have existing laws that address this, and I would argue absolutely not. We don't. And what is evidence of this is when you look at cases of strangulation, which the media often calls choking, we can talk about that terminology later, it, it shows a glaring inconsistency in the charges filed, the sentencing that is handed out as it relates to someone being strangled. You see everything from no charges at all to misdemeanor level charges, Sometimes you see felony level charges. That's usually when someone essentially has either died, obviously, or was almost dead. But there's a lot of inconsistency. And one way to uh, alleviate that is the statute. But the argument is, well, we don't need it. Well, officers and solicitor's offices can necessarily apply the existing law to these instances. Well, apparently not. Right, right. Because, you know, when you're strangled, uh, that is someone trying to take the breath from your from your body to to that has a potentially deadly impact on your life. That's serious. And so when and and I'm getting kind of technical here because just because I know the law, we have some terminology in our assault laws called great bodily injury. Uh as I might be able to explain later, when you understand how deadly and how dangerous 
non-fatal strangulation is, it, it absolutely meets the definition of great bodily injury. So if we know how dangerous it is, even within the great bodily injury language in our existing laws, we should be filing felony level charges, even under assault laws. But again, when you look at cases, it, that doesn't bear out. Right. There's inconsistency. I mean, I've got 50 cases that I've gleaned from the media in the last few years, and relatively few of those 50 cases were ever felony charges. Some of them uh, weren't, you know, they were misdemeanor uh, assault charges, and some of them weren't even assault charges. And then when you get into the issues of getting into court and plea bargains being arranged and someone maybe being charged with a felony level assault, but then then being able to plead to a disorderly conduct or some misdemeanor charge or a non-domestic violence conviction, that creates a lot of problems. Right. That creates a lot of problems for historical tracking and showing patterns of abuse and, and threat to other people. Right. Right. Strangulation is... In, in terms of methodology, it is, it's, it's a scary crime. I mean, it's very personal. Um, mm -hmm. Most of the time when the person is doing it, they are looking you in the eye. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 it's, it, it's a frightening crime. It's, it's fright. I mean, I've talked to a lot of survivors and, you know, it, it's a frightening experience. It is, it changes you. Yeah. And, you know, and, and this is where I can tie a little bit of the law into this understanding. You know, it shouldn't take a law for people to understand that this is dangerous. And I'll tell you why. This is an example I give, give everybody. Every individual person inherently knows that lack of air, with, without air, you will die. You, everybody knows that. All, you know, even babies who put their head underwater will eventually struggle to put their head above water because of that need for oxygen. Because oxygen gives us life. So when someone is strangled, it's a very close up and personal form of assault. It's, yeah, you know, somebody's across a, a field shooting a pistol or a rifle across the street. That's certainly deadly. Strangulation is just as deadly, but it is much more intimate, much more personal, and much more um, physically and emotionally traumatic to the people that it's a very personal crime. And as you correctly stated, when you talk to victims and survivors about this, um, it's something that they can't even put into words. And this is why we don't like to use the word choking. Because choking mechanically and technically is the incorrect term. It's actually strangulation. Choking is a accidental internal blocking of the airway. Strangulation is a form of asphyxiation characterized by external pressure on the veins and arteries in the airway of the neck, thereby depriving the brain and the body of needed oxygen. Choking minimizes the physical violence and it minimizes the danger of what someone can actually experience, and that is ultimately death. And so when people say, well, it's, it's not that serious, well, again, I just say, hey, so, so if it's not that serious, Hold your, hold your head underwater until you, you pass out or die. Do you think that's not serious? And people start to realize, oh, I have this inherent understanding. Right, <laughs> right. So one so, thing, you know, with strangulation, somebody somebody who strangles somebody, it feels like attempted murder. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 their intent isn't just to harm them. Mm -hmm. Like, where does it cross that line? Yeah, well, and so this has not been another debate in South Carolina. There have been cases of, of non-fatal strangulation that were charged with attempted murder. Uh, with respect to making those specific charges, sometimes what is considered is not just what was done, but also what was said okay. and what the perceived intent was. Um, so whenever you look at some strangulation cases, some of the uh, arguments made by the criminal defendant is, well, I didn't know it was dangerous, or I didn't, I wasn't going to kill him. I just wanted them to be quiet, and that creates a little, a little bit of a problem sometimes. And that's why sometimes the charges are not attempted murder. So if you take a different scenario where perhaps strangulation has taken place in either a third party, or the victim themselves, or the suspect themselves 
and made a statement like, you're going to die today, or this will be the last time you see the light of day. Well, those words accompanied by the actions show, show intent. Okay. okay. And the attempted murder charge a lot of times has a lot of weight on proving the intent of the criminal defendant. Okay. And if the proof of proving intent is weak, sometimes that attempted murder charge is not made. It's okay. not an absolute. Okay. Um, I think, personally, I think attempted murder is the absolute appropriate charge in every situation. Again, because of the inherent understanding of every person that oxygen to your body is necessary to have life. Right. right. So, so what? I didn't know. Well, you, what do you mean? You didn't technically know that that would kill somebody. You didn't technically know or medically know that that would do harm to a person's body. No, you did. You just didn't have the medical background to a uh, medical degree to say that, but you inherently knew it. I, I think a ter- attempted murder, and this is what I always promoted with our law enforcement officers and with our prosecutors. If you can make the attempted murder charge, that is exactly where you need to go. Right. Right. But, 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 if that's not on the table, this is where I think the strangulation law steps up and fills a gap that is desperately needed. That makes sense. So in terms of what you're doing now, you are, I mean, you're, you're traveling across the state, um, training Mm -hmm. law enforcement, um, medical professionals on, on strangulation on, and you know other things as well, but and, and strangulation, um, what to look for, um, what what is what are some of the things that um, that you include in your training? Well, first of all, we talk about why there isn't the public awareness. Because um, again, as I stated at the beginning, I think if public awareness was raised and people's eyes were opened we would see a recognition of much higher rates than what we know now. But again, because of lack of specific curriculum, lack of coverage in the media, lack of you know, like public service announcements and everything, people just don't know how dangerous it is, even the victims themselves and the professionals that interact with them. You know, we do a really great job of talking about domestic violence in October. We do a great job of talking about DUI and drunk driving you know, awareness we do a good job of talking about human traffic trafficking regularly, but how often do we really talk about domestic violence and strangulation? It needs to be happening every year. So that's one thing I cover is why is there no public awareness? And, 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 and also it relates to misinformation, you know, using the word choking versus strangulation, um, you know, things also misinformation and what was taught 20 years ago, what we were taught 20, 25 years ago about strangulation was that, uh, somebody's going to have marks on them. When someone's strangled, you'll see petechial hemorrhages in the whites of their eyes, the little these little burst capillaries, and they'll have marks on their neck. That was that was bad research and that was bad science. What we know now is that uh, the frequency of you seeing external injuries is actually lower than than what we thought. The the frequency, the increased frequency of more subtle signs and symptoms is is more frequent. So let me give you an example. About 50% of strangulation cases, the victim will have no external injuries visible on their body. Even in fatal cases of strangulation, about 50% of the time, there will be no external injuries on the body. And that means that by relying on our visual uh, training or training to use our eyes, we're missing more than half because we're looking externally. So what I train is to to consider other signs and symptoms that indicate internal injury. So some of those more subtle but more frequent indicators is a change or altered voice. Uh, because of this area being damaged, it can change or alter someone's ability to project their voice or their, their regular tone of voice that they talk in. Might be higher, might be lower, but it's about 50% of the time it's altered in some way. We also have um, breathing difficulty. It might be wheezing, whistling um, from that uh, airway being damaged or starting to swell. Trouble swallowing, trouble breathing. Uh, there could also be um, also just holding the neck or holding the head, head, you know, the head hurting, the neck hurting. 
Um, there's also short-term uh, memory loss as well. And um, that is one thing that really causes a lot of problems is because uh, people in the criminal justice field expect victims to be able to relate what happened. Well, loss of consciousness, what we call LOC, there's indications of a loss of consciousness where the brain did not have enough oxygen, and so therefore it didn't develop a memory. It is common for victims, survivors, to not remember what happened during that strangulation event when they lose consciousness. So they might say something like, I remember being over here and this happening up until a point, but then I woke up on the ground, or I woke up in the ditch, or I woke up in the bathroom, well, that indicates loss of consciousness. That indicates something was going on with the brain. Again, you may see nothing on the neck, no marks or injuries, but they're indicating that they don't have a memory. For some people, that ties to credibility. It's like, if you, okay, if you don't have any injuries on your neck and you can't tell me a story, then it didn't happen. That's not actually true. That's not a good way to look at it. Right. There's also vision changes. Again, I, I, I don't know what the victim experienced with their vision when they were going through it. But if I ask them, you know, what, what things did you see? What did you experience? Sometimes they talk about seeing little stars like shoot around their face. You know, we all have experienced that and not from strangulation, but sometimes we bend stand over. up too fast yeah. or we bend over and we see these little stars. Well, that is um, some, some optic nerve interaction with our brain. Well, Strangulation victims can also say things like, well, I lost color. Everything turned to shades of gray, or I lost my peripheral vision, or I looked like I was, it looked like I was looking through a tunnel. These would all be indicators. We also have uh, involuntary urination and defecation on oneself. Uh, when your brain is deprived of oxygen and, and, it is, and it's becoming damaged due to lack of oxygen, your autonomic functions, your automatic functions in your body don't work right, and so you lose and you, you develop incontinence. Um, the muscles that control your bladder and your rectum uh, relax, and so victims may involuntarily urinate or defecate on themselves. Now, that brings up the issue, too, of, you know, when officers, whoever gets there, are they in those clothes that they were in? Um, or have they been disposed of? And often out of a embarrassment, those clothes have been thrown away and uh, disposed of, and no one asks where they are or, or why that occurred. And so those are just some of the more subtle signs and symptoms. But the one thing I want people to remember is if you're, if you're expecting to see marks on somebody, 50% of the time you're not. And you're going to have to pick up on these other subtle signs and symptoms. So if they do pick up on other subtle signs, what, what is, what do they do? What, I mean, what is the next step? If they do, or if they're picking up like me, I, I got a feeling here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, ideally the professionals, again, expecting our victim survivors to have this information or have this knowledge would be a rare thing right now with public information that would improve where they could almost uh, somewhat triage themselves to a degree. But as of right now, we have to rely on our professionals and our experts. And so if there is an indication of strangulation, the immediate protocol that should take place is, is getting to the hospital. Uh, when you look at your criminal justice, your law enforcement officers, yes, we have, a, we have a desire to hold offenders accountable and charge people. But the number one concern at that point is patient care and triage. So a lot of states who've instituted a strangulation statute have also instituted strangulation screening protocols. In other words, a, a way for professionals to evaluate the situation. And when there's indication of strangulation, getting this person immediately to the hospital. Now, to be fair, not every victim survivor wants to go to the hospital because they're worried about, you know, perhaps embarrassment. They're also worried about bills hospital bills. They're also worried about uh, transportation. That should be something that they, that they don't have to worry about. But we know that it's a, a worry. They also have an understanding that perhaps when they go to the hospital, there may be some disclosure that takes place or some evidence that points to who did it. And they're trying to avoid further abuse. But what we have to do is we have to speak in reality and we have to speak in a very direct way 
I'm not one to want to cause fear, but this is directly related to their life. And so when discussing with these victims, the need, we have to say, look, your life is at risk. If we we are indicating that you may have been strangled without immediate medical intervention, you could suffer some permanent injury or death weeks or even months from now. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. You can die from a strangulation weeks or months after the event without appropriate medical care. So a lot of times if we educate them on the dangers and they realize that self-preservation is in their benefit, they're more apt to get that medical uh, intervention. And so that's step number one, which then leads us to the hospital and having the forensic nurses and the, and the uh, available to do the appropriate exams. And those forensic nurses don't just do uh, triage and patient care, but they also are our evidence collection people that uh, are able to gather information that can be turned over to law enforcement to, for criminal justice purposes. So yeah, when we see these subtle signs and symptoms, I tell everybody, you got to get them to the hospital. Do whatever you can. You can't force them. You can't drag them against their will, but do everything you can to um, point out that it's in their overall benefit health-wise. Don't even get into the prosecution or who's going to be charged. Hey, you need to take care of you. We want to take care of you. Let's get you to the hospital. Okay. okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. Are there other aspects of the training um, that you think, you know, like in terms of, you know, statutes and, you know, handling the scene that are helpful as you're, as you're walking through this training? Yeah. So, so again, because we don't have a strangulation law right now, I have to work within the confines of the laws that we do have. So when I'm, presenting all this, and a lot of it is kind of medical information because in order for people to understand the dangers, they have to understand what's going on inside the body right. to, to realize those dangers. So beyond that, when we realize and we establish that this strangulation, every strangulation is potentially lethal immediately or in the weeks ahead, we have to understand that depending on the victim survivor, we may have to pull from the statutes that currently exist to give the appropriate charge. So again, uh, within domestic violence, we look at uh, what's called domestic violence of a high and aggravated nature. Mm -hmm. That's the highest level of domestic violence in South Carolina. That's about as close to attempted murder as you can get. But the language in there says that um, restriction of air or blood flow must, must cause loss of consciousness. Well, what if the victim didn't lose consciousness? Right. And see, that, that, that hamstrings law enforcement making that charge because what we know is you don't have to lose consciousness to die later from a strangulation. Right. But um, So within domestic violence, we, hey, promote, hey, look for any indication of loss of consciousness or stupor. Within the non-household member definition, we look at our different levels of assault and that great bodily injury. Can we, with what we know about strangulation, can we apply the evidence and what we see and what we've been told to, to support a great bodily injury risk? And that's another thing that people that, of the law may not understand. You don't actually have to create, you don't actually, you don't have to actually create great bodily injury. Even the potential for great bodily injury can subject you to a charge, a felony charge under assault. And then with respect to our child protective statutes or our vulnerable adult protective statutes, which most of those are felonies anyway. Um, so, so law enforcement and prosecutors have a, a, a selection or a list to go through. But again, it's not always the, the, the correct charge is not always made. Right. And right. here we are back to why we need the strangulation statute by itself. Do you find, Do you find when you're doing trainings with, you know, first responders, do you find they're receptive to this? Are they surprised by the information you're giving them? Um, you know, like before talking to you, I had no clue, you know, the statistics behind this and, you know, the, the risk that these, that these offenders bring to the community. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so I'll share you, I'll share my experience and I'll share the experience told to me by first responders. When I got my first entry-level training into non-fatal strangulation awareness 
and, and prosecution and evidence collection. The first thing that came to my mind was past cases that I had, I had already dealt with where I realized strangulation was part of it and I didn't get it. I had specific cases and people in my mind as a law enforcement officer that I was like, that's what I saw. That's what was going on. And I didn't get it. And because I didn't get it, the right charges weren't made and the right care wasn't given. And I felt guilty, but I didn't know what I didn't know. Right. And so when I present to first responders, the first thing that I kind of get from them is I did not realize how dangerous this was. I didn't realize that some of the things that you said, I saw in other cases before today and I didn't get it. And what are those victim survivors suffering now because I didn't know any better? And so that one is that real, realization is they, they just didn't realize how dangerous it was. But then also for themselves related to assaults and, and killing against law enforcement officers, they're like, I never thought about, you know, that if somebody was strangling other people, that that would be the person most likely to kill me too. Yeah, domestic and so, violence calls are the, I mean, they're the scariest calls for a law enforcement officer. It's, you don't know what you're walking into. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, law enforcement's a, a dangerous profession anyway. Even the most innocent of calls have led to officers being killed. But um, when officers, again, have dealt with uh, victims who've indicated strangulation, that officer now knows I can help save this victim survivor and I can help save myself and other law enforcement officers because I know who I'm dealing with now. I know their capabilities and I know what they're willing to do. And so that's usually what I get is just that their mind is blown, just like mine. I was like, I cannot believe that I didn't know this sooner. And what can I do to make it better right. uh, from here on out? And that's kind of what my drive has been is, is to improve where we have been and what we were told years ago. So legislatively, um, do you, are you going to keep going at it? Like, are you going to try to get more traction Oh, I mean, absolutely. I'm not giving up. I mean, this is something that is absolutely necessary for South Carolina. I just don't think South Carolina has woken up yet. I, I do think, and credit to you for being a member of media. I don't know if you would call yourself that, but I certainly call yourself call you that. And there's not very many media outlets who are willing to cover this topic. I think as public awareness grows, there will be a greater and greater demand for accountability with our General Assembly to do what they can to protect South Carolina across the board, not just related to domestic violence, but our law enforcement officers, our public at large. Uh, I'm not giving up. Um, we've got more movement now than we ever have. Uh, you know, years ago, we didn't have a strangulation task force. We have one now. Uh, it was created by um, some other individuals, but for the, again, the purpose of bringing attention to this across disciplines and then moving us forward into the future uh, legislatively, but also within respect to professional standards, whether it's, you know, whether you're a nurse, you're a doctor, you're a victim advocate, let's develop some standards of um, advisement, advisement and follow-up care and advice for people that indicate the strangulation. And uh, this is something a lot of people don't know. Um, back during our first bill, uh, we collected 10,000 signatures I've got them. I've got 10,000 signatures of South Carolinians who were in support of that strangulation bill the first time it was introduced, you know, almost seven, eight, nine years ago. I am certain there would be a lot more than 10,000. 10,000 should have made a statement, but for some reason it didn't. We're, myself and other individuals are out there every week trying to talk about this, trying to bring it up, trying to bring attention to the issue. And, and I'm not giving up because the, the lives of South Carolinians are at risk if we don't do something. Why would we not do something when we know how dangerous it is? You know, there's yeah, only there's... so many stories I can write where, you know, it, it, it's a homicide and you're writing the story and you're researching the past. And just in the six months, I can think of three where, you know, the, the victim had been the, vec the, 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 the had been strangled. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it just, it just, it's over and over. It's repetitive. And yeah. it just, see, it just, I can't figure out 
why we're not doing more. I mean, thank you for doing more because it's it's important. Yeah, and I, I know we're kind of beating dead horse and being repetitive, but again, this goes back to why I think the strangulation statute just needs us for tracking purposes. Right. You, know, you and I and other individuals who look into this are fortunate to have found indications of strangulation events preceding these homicides. But we've been lucky because we've been diligent. People that are less diligent are not going to find this, these patterns of history. And, uh, But again, the more and more you look into it, the, the more frequent you realize that it is. You know, we have documents and we have reports, we have news and media outlets that are kind of on the record, but I can't tell you how many times I've had personal conversations with people that never made a report to the police, that never took anything to the media, that tell me over and over and over, I was strangled, I was strangled, my mom was strangled, my sister was strangled, my friend was strangled. It is everywhere. It is everywhere. And, you know, to to bring this kind of around on the ability to find this pattern in the 2015 domestic violence reform bill, it mentioned, or what we put, uh, what was put in there was a mandatory incident report for domestic violence incidents. The reason for that was so that law enforcement and solicitors in the judiciary across South Carolina would be able to look at a domestic violence incident in a historical context to get a better understanding of what occurred before law enforcement intervention. Sometimes when law enforcement gets there, there's been a five-year history of domestic violence, but only known to the two people in the house. But what is scary is since that, since that bill was passed into law, there's still law enforcement agencies out there that aren't doing incident reports for domestic violence. So there we're, there we're stuck with another issue of uh, limiting our ability to track patterns in a historical context for domestic, just for domestic violence. We're not even talking about strangulation. Right. right. Um, and that's something that obviously, you know, needs um, improvement is that tracking ability. And um, so, yeah, this, this is something that I hope going forward, you and I and others can speak with more certainty on because – we see it. Right. We've seen it in documents, but we need that those incidents that kind of happen on the periphery to become part of the foundation of understanding. And public awareness is, is definitely part of that, for sure, for sure. Well, I'm glad to help with that. I, um, I can't think of anything more important than protecting, protecting people. I mean, mm-hmm. it just it just seems like such a such a simple thing to do. <laughs> like, let's do you it. Know, and I was thinking, I, I, I'd like to bring up a, a point, if I might, um, that perhaps, or I don't know that it's been an argument as of yet, but uh, with relating to the strangulation statute, or excuse, not statute yet, hopefully we have one, Fingers a crossed. strangulation bill, there is a glaring inconsistency with something in South Carolina related to this. People say, well, what are you talking about? All right, here, here it is. When I'm trying to talk to members of our General Assembly and other people about inconsistency, they want an example. Here's the perfect example. In 2023, a law enforcement reform bill was passed into law. In that law, it states that law enforcement officers cannot use neck restraints or choke holds lest it constitutes deadly force. So what that means is our General Assembly has recognized that neck holds, choke holds, and neck restraints are inherently deadly. Otherwise, it wouldn't be qualified as deadly force. So how is it that we have a statute that limits the use of those holds to our law enforcement officers unless deadly force is authorized, but we don't apply that same standard across the board to anyone else who uses that in a criminal way. Uh-huh. That's a really good and point. And when I brought that to the attention of some of our General Assembly, they're like, you know, I never thought of that. Well, I'm, I'm like, well, hopefully you think about that and consider more that this this bill that would become a law is actually, actually needed. It just makes um, sense. Yeah, I mean... They've already recognized it, 
but they don't recognize it within the realm of a law enforcement use. It doesn't, you know, when someone's being strangled, it doesn't matter who the person is. Strangulation is strangulation. Mm-hmm. It, it should not be related to their title, either official title or, a, you know, a, a title by any other person, you know, str- you know, victim, survivor, police officer, whatever. The body doesn't know. You know, the only thing body, the body is relating to is this pressure and the restriction of, you know, the oxygen to the, the brain, which, I mean, and, and with that being said, and I hope I'm not going on a tangent here, there's, there is 25 known medical complications with being strangled. 25 known medical complications. I'm sure there are more, but 25 that have been researched and substantiated. But the number one organ that is damaged during a strangulation is the brain. Mm-hmm. Lack of oxygen. Yeah, yeah, the brain is the number one organ first and most adversely affected by lack of oxygen. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's deadly and we need to recognize it as such. Well, thank you so much for sitting down to talk to me about this. Uh, you know that I am a huge supporter of this legislation and am happy to help you get the word out, um, mm-hmm. help you build awareness of how much it's needed. Um, so I, yeah. I really do appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today. No, it's my pleasure. And, and if people want to uh, kind of follow up uh, on legislative updates and training and information, I do have a Facebook group page called Strangulation Law for SC. Strangulation Law for SC is not spelled out South Carolina. Uh, doing a general search on there, you'll probably see it. It's got a little image of a, a, a thermal image of an individual who was strangled. Um, but yeah, so I, I put stuff on there related to South Carolina, uh, our legislative efforts, uh, speaking and training engagements, and then just uh, uh, links to videos and stuff for more training and understanding to, to really share with anybody, quite frankly. And you're getting a YouTube channel started, too. Uh, yeah, I am. Uh, I'm going to be starting a YouTube channel. It's going to be called Sacred Mission. Um, it's not specifically focused on strangulation and domestic violence, but it will focus on issues of personal safety, mm-hmm. uh, awareness and advisements for people that are in, a, in any type of position that need help and don't know don't know what to do, how to do it or where to go. I'm excited for all that. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me today, and I will uh, look forward to talking to you again soon. Sounds great. It was a pleasure. Thank you.